today we oh okay that was that okay um today we're going to be talking about jumping castles and science using apps now the whole idea for this sort of presentation came about about a year ago we were approached by um, some friends of ours in the SciComm community that said we've got a conference and a jumping castle what can you do um, and we were talking about getting some you know traditional data loggers for meters and things from um, the school that was hosting the conference and as we were developing the presentation we kind of had a revelation that everybody in the room was going to have one of these which is a um, smartphone. Now smartphones are super powerful as I'm going to talk about very very soon uh, but I'm just going to start very quickly with an overview of apps. Um, and what sort of apps we've got and what we can use them for and some examples of apps. Now I am going to preface this with a um, uh, disclaimer saying that these apps are all very skewed towards my own personal interests. Um, so you'll probably find me nerding out about space exploration and things like that. Um, but you know, if you've got any questions about other apps, I'll do my best to help you. But as we'll find, there are lots and lots of different options. So I'm going to turn off my video now because you probably don't need to see me anymore. Um, and I'm going to jump into my presentation just here. Now, for those of you who aren't sort of familiar with physics, uh, we've been around for, you know, 10 years. We do outreach across Australia. Last year we sort of reached about 160,000 students locally. Um, now, we do all sorts of stuff, including in-person outreach and video conferencing. Um, so we basically just try to talk to as many people as possible, and we sort of promote science wherever possible. Now, I decided to do a Google just to work out how many apps we were talking about. Now, if you Google education apps for iPad, you get something like 95 and a half million Google hits. Right? If you change that to science education, you still get 19 million Google hits. So there is a ridiculous amount of stuff on the internet about apps in education. And so it sort of becomes this minefield of what do I use? Now, in classrooms these days, I know that there are lots of tablets, and most of them are iPads from my experience. So I'm going to be focusing on stuff that is available on iPads today. Now, there is occasionally a difference between what's available with um, iPads and what's available with Android. And there's often some sort of equivalent, uh, but not always. So it's sort of one of those things that's very kind of um, platform specific, but it's part of the fun, I guess, of finding what works. Now, in my experience, in terms of education, there are four main categories of apps. So we've got games, we've got information sources, we've got interactive environments, and we've got tools. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail by what I mean about these four sources. There are other types of apps, but I found that I can categorize most into these four categories. Now, I'm going to skip into here where we've got games. Now, games are your traditional learning games, and there are all types of games. Now, um, one that I love and I could play for hours is Tinkerbox, and that's the one that we're seeing in the top left hand corner of the screen. Now I have put up the demo screen in here so you can sort of see what it's about but essentially it teaches physics and engineering concepts by um, getting you to drag in components so that you know you get the ball from A to B and it sort of mimics you know proper gravity and proper earth forces so that you get a real idea of what should be happening to that ball, what should be happening to those dominoes in the um, example you see here. Now, down in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got one that's produced by NASA, which is a lunar electric rover. Now, this basically just mimics their lunar electric rover that they have on their website, but makes it a little bit more accessible to a tablet. Um, the idea of this one is that we drive it around the moon. Now, kids are very used to games and um, iPads and tablets and things. I know that our company iPad gets used regularly by Ben's kids. So we've got about 40 different, you know, kids games on there. Some of them educational, some of them not. Now, you've got 
lots of different educational games. I've seen games from maths to history to, you know, English games where you've got to, you know, work out the sentences and do comprehension activities in order to win the game. So there's lots and lots of different games out there. And games is something that I think lots of people already use um, and is one that is very straightforward. So I don't want to spend too much time on games because what I sort of want to get at here is that we want to use the power that's in these platforms. Uh, games are great and we should be using games, but as you'll see, I'm kind of skewed towards one end of this, these four categories. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next one, which are our information sources. Now, your information sources are almost like your portable encyclopedias on your iPad. And there are a lot of these produced by lots of different people. Now, the one we're looking at here is a molecules app. You can look up almost any chemical in existence. Now, um, disclaimer, my background is chemistry, so I love this app. And you can basically grab a molecule move it around in 3D, look at it from any dimension um, and examine it. Now, this one is basically what this um, presentation is brought to you by today. It is caffeine. Um, so it's probably one of my favorite molecules, which is why I've used it as our example right here. Um, so, you know, and the other really good thing about this one is that you can go from this ball and sticks to the space drawing molecules, which if you've done any science is sort of where it turns into this really big bubbly thing. Um, and uh, it's really, really useful and almost universally covers every chemical in existence. I sort of looked up a really, really um, not common one that plagued me during my last year of uni and it was still in there. So it was pretty comprehensive. But essentially, it's just accessing a database. Um, this is one that's produced by NASA. and it's called NASA Visualization Explorer. Um, it essentially just links back to NASA's site, but it is an app version that sort of categorizes all their main research projects they've got going on right now um, and has videos and photos and information about, you know, what probes they're sending up. This is a um, probe they're sending up to Bennu, I think is how it's produced, how it's pronounced. Um, and, you know, it's Basically, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Here's links back to our website so that you can learn more if people are interested. So it's another basically just a database of information. Um, and, you know, you might find that you get the same information off Wikipedia and stuff, but sometimes having it all contained in an app can be really, really useful because it might keep students on task because we know that when you give kids the internet, they sometimes go off in other directions. Now, this is another information source, but this one's a little bit more interactive. This one's called Pocket Universe, um, and I actually forgot to take a screenshot at night yesterday. You'll see that this one is a picture of the sky and the land during the day. Now, if you use this during the night, the interface actually changes, and you get a picture of stars and constellations, and essentially you can, you know, wave the iPad around and then sort of laughing at me right now because I'm actually waving my iPad around as if you could see me right now. Um, you sort of wave the iPad around and point it at a star or point it at a constellation and it will name it for you. You know, and if you're looking for Venus in the sky, for example, it can help you find Venus or it can help you find any star, more or less. But again, this is just accessing a database of information, right? It's not processing anything, it's not giving you anything new. The only thing it's doing is taking your GPS coordinates and calculating what the night sky should look um, at based on what we know from astronomy. Now, one thing I probably need to highlight here is that on your school iPads, you may have issues with using location services. Um, I know that, you know, in some schools, for privacy reasons, a lot of the GPS um, location services and things are turned off, and that might be something that needs to be negotiated with schools in order to use an app like Pocket Universe. Um, having your GPS coordinate, coordinates help it, helps it make, you know, um, sense of where you are and helps you gather a whole lot more information on things. Um, 
but that is kind of one of those case-by-case -case basis things. Um, if you're doing some astronomy, you might need that location in order to work out where you are and point to certain spots in the sky. Now, the other one that I looked at before, my last one, is interactive environments. Now, these are your sort of immersive lab tools. Well, a lot of them are used for immersive lab tools when we're talking about science. This one here is called 3D Cell Chain. Now, what you've got is a screenshot of me looking at a cell. You can drag your finger around this cell, turn it around, manipulate it in 3D, and click on any component of that cell. Um, it tells you what its name is, and if you click on the name, it gives you a whole lot of information for it. Now, there's another part of this where you can, um, uh, another part of this where you can basically uh, set up a stain as you would if you were doing microscopy. So it simulates a whole lot of stuff that you could do in the lab that you can't normally do in a classroom if you don't have a proper microscope set up or if you don't have lab set up or if you just don't have access to those chemicals. Um, so it's really, really good for those, um, you know, lab-like environments. It's really cool. Um, ben was nerding out on this one before because Ben's a biologist. So it's a really, really great app. Now, this is another interactive environment, which is really, really cool. Um, this uh, group experiments have about 10 apps on the store. Now, this is their only free one. Yes, Peggy, these are all apps. Um, and all of these are available on the Apple App Store. I can't say about Android because for some of them I haven't checked. Some of the bigger ones are available cross-platform. Now, this one here is an app that um, looks at, well, this one is basic physics. And this one, you can compare different planets and you can comp compare the mass um, of something on, you know, the Earth and Mars and look at the different effects of gravity, which is really, really quite cool. Explorements also have a full suite of paid apps and um, they, are really, really cool. They're all about $2.50 each, and if I had more time, I would go through and buy them all and play with them because they look great. Now, um, I can post a list of these on Twitter or send them through or something. Linda, I'll look at that when we're done. Um, but yeah, I'm throwing out a lot of apps today, and a lot of these are just a small representative sample of what's out there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the end about, you know, how can you look at what is a good app and, you know, work out the good from the bad. Now, all of the ones that I've mentioned so far do have a free version, um, which is useful, but a lot of them do have an upgrade version which doesn't have ads on it, and I'll talk a little bit about those ads later. All right, now the last um, category of apps, which is the one that really excites me, is the tool side of things, okay? And that's because your smart devices are really, really, really powerful. And I think a lot of people forget this when they're using them to teach. Like, I've seen lots of apps in classrooms, and they're used as word processors, and they're used as for internet surfing, and they're used to play things like Angry Birds, which is great and fun, and it's getting kids involved and engaged. But the reality is you've got something that's really, 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 really super powerful in your pocket. Now, you've got light sensors and proximity sensors, which means they can measure if something's coming towards them. You've got GPS, you've got compasses, you've got microphones, you've got speakers, and you've got accelerometers. Right? There's a lot of data that you can grab from these. Now, in case you haven't already picked up the tone in my voice, this is my favorite category of educational apps, are ones that we can use as tools, because they sort of take your um, smartphone from just being a device, or your tablet, or your iPad, from just being a device into being something that's truly useful. And in some cases, they can replace equipment that costs thousands of dollars. Now, this is just to give you guys some perspective. Um, when I was in high school, we did this experiment for an accelerometer. Um, we got a bottle of water and floated a cork in it. Now, the idea of this experiment is that you can measure if something is accelerating, that is, you know, changing its speed by waving the, by looking at the cork when the bottle's moving. If the cork moves a lot, 
you've got a lot of acceleration, right? So this is what I did when I was in high school. Now, right now, in most of your pockets, you've got this sort of thing going on. Now, Apollo 11, you may or may not know, was the mission that reached the moon in 1969. Now, the computer that guided that had 64 kilobytes of memory, a 2 megahertz processor. It weighed 32 kilos. There were 19 buttons on it, and it will cost $24 billion, right? Now, the first generation iPad, now I've used the first generation iPad as my reference point um, because I've sort of looked at everything today based on an iPad, but most smartphones developed in the last five years are actually more powerful than this. Um, so it's just to give us a benchmark of what we've got. Now, your iPad has 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, a kilobyte is a 1,000 bytes. Uh, a gigabyte is a 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 bytes. So we're looking at a million times more information capacity in there. It's got a one gigahertz processor, which is like a thousand times more powerful than the one that sent something to Apollo. It weighs less than a kilo. You've got this lovely touch screen, and you know you can pick up an iPad these days for like three hundred dollars, even less on eBay. So that's what we're talking about power-wise. And the one thing that I want to sort of the one take-home message I guess I guess of this is that. You know, we really should be using this power a little bit more, and a lot of these tool apps let us do that. Now, my favorite tool, my favorite device in these devices is an accelerometer. Now, in your mobile phone or in your tablet, this accelerometer is really only used so that your phone can tell up from down and it can, you know, reorient your um, screen if you're watching YouTube, basically, right? So I think that this component of your phone is really, really underutilized. Now, you can see a picture here where we've got something that looks like a computer chip. Now, yeah, Peggy, um, all smartphones do have accelerometers in them or any smartphone that is able to, you know, rotate the screen and stuff like that. Now, if you have a look at the blue bits, the blue bits are these tiny little bits of silicon, and they're not fixed to the chip. The yellow bits are capacitors, so they measure a um, electric current. Now, basically what happens is as that blue bit moves back and forth with the phone moving, the capacitors can measure um, the difference in resistance, so how much uh, electrical current is able to pass between the two capacitors and gives it an idea of how much it's moved and actually can be quite accurate. Now, there is a link to a YouTube video at the bottom, um, and that's where I've got this screen cap from, and the engineering guy on YouTube does a really, really good rundown of exactly how this works. You know, I could spend 15 minutes right now explaining exactly how an accelerometer works in a phone, but essentially the blue bits wiggle and the yellow bits measure it. Um, it makes it really, really uh, good in your phone, but if we can, you know, harness the power of this, it will be really, really useful. Now, the accelerometer is in the tablet too. So, um, Smartphones and tablets all have accelerometers, right? This is used to rotate the screen in the right orientation. So whether you've got it up or down or upside down or sideways, this is what measures that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there might be some really, really, really cheap accelerometers on the market that may not, but I've used a dozen different types of tablets um, from a dozen different manufacturers, and they all seem to have some sort of accelerometer in them. So, um, yeah, it's what makes it really, really useful for the stuff I'm about to talk about. Now, the one thing we have to remember with an accelerometer is that we're never going to get a true zero reading on it. Now, this comes down to physics and the fact that um, on Earth we're subject to gravity, now, gravity uh, on Earth is 
9.8 meters per second per second. Now you'll see that my first picture here on the left is my smartphone when I hold it upwards and you'll see that we've got about a 10.2. Now, if it's lying on the table, we've got 9.4, but you'll, the one thing you'll notice is that on one of these, you've got the y-axis showing us a 10.2, and the other one is the z-axis showing us. And that's showing me that my phone is being held different ways. The first one is vertical, the second one is lying down. So you can sort of see that we've got our x, Y and Z axis axes um, measured on that smartphone accelerometer. So when you're doing experiments using these tools, you've always got to remember that this is the one thing that you need to factor in in all your calculations is that gravity is always going to be there, right? No matter what we try, we can't escape it unless we get really, really, really far away from Earth. Now, this is uh, just a screen cap of what one of the apps I've been using looks like. This is called Sensor Log, um, and essentially it gives you a readout in real time of the acceleration that the iPad is um, experiencing. Now this is me sitting at my desk, shaking it up and down and side to side and back to front. All right, so that's what you're seeing with those different waves. Um, now you'll notice that we do have three lines, and that's because it's measuring X, Y, and Z. Now, um, each time I shake it in a different way, you'll see that a different axis gets messed up. So when I go um, up and down, that was my Z axis, and all sorts of things like that. Um, the one thing that I absolutely loved about this app, and it kind of makes me sad that this app isn't available on Android, um, and it doesn't really, it's okay on iPhone, but we'll get to that in a second, um, is that it also records the orientation of your device. Now, the one thing we also have, another thing we've got to watch is the orientation of your device. If your device is up, then, you know, you'll get, your measurement along one axis. If it's on its side, it's going to measure that on a different axis. So it'll be X or it will be Y or it will be Z. So knowing which way up your device was can be really, really useful. Um, and I'll show you a plot later on that gives you an idea of uh, how you can work that up. Now, this gathers a bucket load of data and you can actually email it to yourself as a CSV file, which you can then pull into Excel. Now, I'm just going to give you an idea of how much data this gives you. All right, it gave me that much data from about 30 seconds of playing around with it, and I've purposely zoomed out of it because, um, you know, we don't really need to see all those numbers. You will see, though, that there's all these uh, columns with zeros in it. Now, the zeros are there because um, I was using a school-provided iPad to get this data, and the location services were turned off. So you'll see that it didn't gather any data for that. Um, but, you know, you've got your x-axis and your y-axis and your z-axis and all the minute measurements of your accelerometer, which is really, really cool. Now, whenever you're processing this data, you really just have to pull out three bits of information, and that's your x, y, and z which are fairly um, clearly labelled at the top once you go into the specifics of that data. Now, this app here that I've got the icon up for is called SparkView. Um, and I kind of love SparkView just a little bit. Now, I'm not being paid by anybody to say that I love SparkView. Um, I have used it quite a bit. And it's also made by PASCO, which are a group that already sell data loggers to lots of schools. And a lot of high schools you probably find will already have PASCO equipment there that links into this app. It helps you see the data in real time. But um, if you upload the app to any of the devices you've got listed below, it will use the onboard sensors to take measurements. Now, the really cool thing about SparkView is that you can have all of, well, you can have several experiments running at once. Um, you can get these screens where you can choose what you want. 
um, each one of those boxes can be a different information source. So, you know, you can measure X, Y, and Z separately. You can even measure the sound levels in the room. Um, it's really quite cool. Um, you can also just put in pictures and stuff in some of them as well. Now, here's what you're sort of looking at. Uh, you can then um, output a graph of all the data you're getting, um, and you can choose your x and your y axes. I mean, traditionally, we put time on the x axis, and um, any of the measurements are listed on the right hand side. So you sort of see acceleration, x, y, z, or your resultant acceleration, which is the combination of all three. Um, or you can do your sound level and sound intensity. Now, if you are doing quite a physical experiment where somebody's jumping around and being a bit silly, um, sound level can be quite fun to map. Now, this is me when I first got my hands on a tablet with SparkView. Uh, we put it in a vest and I went out to the park to sort of give it a play because, you know, I wanted to understand what data did it sort of give me and what could I see and how accurate was it. Now, we used this to test it out, a playground flying fox. Now, the reason I'm putting this in there is because these things can be used to create really engaging science lessons. I mean, kids have the most fun when you give them cool stuff to do. If you tell them they can jump on a swing or they can play on a flying fox, I think that's kind of a route to instant engagement. Um, now, I didn't have any, um, you know, high school students with me. I was um, hanging at my cousin's house when this happened, so I actually stole his daughter for some experiments. Now, this is the two of us on the flying fox, and you'll see that there's quite dramatically different um, data here, right? Now, the top one is one set of data, the bottom one is another set of data, and you'll notice that the main difference you're seeing is um, the overall acceleration. Now, I'm going to explain why this is so different in a second, but you'll notice that one, you only get a difference of about five meters per second square, and the other one, you get nearly 25 meters per second square. Okay, now, these are your two test subjects in this case. We've got Indy, who's nine years old, and we've got me, and I'm a couple more than nine years old. So the main difference we're looking at here is size. Okay, Indy is probably a third of my weight. So um, if we go back to this, you can sort of see that Indy's um, resultant chart had much bigger differences in acceleration. And this really just comes down to Newton's law of motion. It's F equals MA, right? You've got a smaller mass, therefore you need less force to get greater acceleration. Okay, and that's what we're looking at right here. Okay, is that smaller mass leads, needs less force to go. Um, now, Peggy's asking me, do we have to teach kids how to interpret the data? In certain parts of high school, I believe in the curriculum, learning how to interpret this data is part of it. Um, it's also interesting just to get kids to look at what they can do with the stuff they've got in their pockets. You know, um, they may not be interested in physics, but if you can show them that they can prove something like this just by playing on a swing, they might get a little bit more interested in physics or something like that. Now, the other one we used to do this, which I sort of mentioned before, is that we got some jumping castles and some sumo suits. Now, this was actually part of a lab tech conference uh, in Queensland last year. And, um, yeah, basically we were approached and they said, we've got jumping castles, we've got sumo suits, what can we do with them? So what we did was we strapped people to accelerometers and we put smartphones in their pockets with some apps on them and we had a lot of fun. Now, we also put jumping castles and sumo suits together, which was quite interesting. Um, we looked at some collisions. Now, uh, what you're seeing here is me on the left and Deb on the right. Now, it was actually Deb's idea to get the jumping castle in the first place. I can't take full credit for that. Um, now, in terms of experimental limitations, because that's something that we like to talk about uh, as scientists, I guess, and the one thing we found is that in sumo suits, we didn't get 
very usable data. And the main reason for this was that there was too much cushioning. Right, so in order for the accelerometer in our phone to be set off, it had to be impacted on or something like that. And with all this padding around us, it didn't work so well. So when we're on the jumping castle, as you'll see in a second, we got some really, really good data. Um, but in the sumo suits, it didn't come up so well. And that was mostly just because there was so much padding. Um, and the padding got in the way of our scientific measurements. All right. Now, at the conference, uh, one of the sales reps that was there, his daughter, Ash, was there. Um, and she wanted to hang out with the jumping castle. So I said, Ash, if you want to hang out at the jumping castle, you have to come help me get some data. So we strapped the uh, tablet with spark view on it to Ash. Um, and she hit the jumping castle. And then I hit the jumping castle too. And what you'll see is a very similar sort of spread of um, resultant acceleration. OK, and you know, that was us jumping on the jumping castle. You'll see that Ash has bigger um, changes in acceleration. Now, that is, again, I think, as a result of F equals MA. Ash was 11 years old. She's a lot lighter than I am. So she was able to change her elex her acceleration um, with a lot less force. So you see these huge, big changes in there. Um, now, we also thought it would be fun to compare Jumpy Castle to the ground. Now, you can see our two um, resultant acceleration charts here. But I think the next one along is probably Hold on, I'm going to skip forward one. Here we go, because this is better. Um, you can sort of see, if I jump forward to you, because I managed to put a couple of slides out of order, if we compare the castle to the ground, you've actually got quite a good experiment in there. Now, when we were jumping on the castle, um, you can see that our changes in acceleration is um, a little bit greater than when we're on the ground. And that's really just because when you're on the ground, you sort of come to a sudden stop and then you take off again. Now, Joe, that is a really, really good question. Um, is the flatter part where you stop jumping? Now, what you will notice here is that what I've graphed has actually changed. Back on my previous slides, we were looking at the resultant acceleration, which was the combination of x, y, and z. So it was acceleration in all directions. What I'm looking at here is purely just the y-axis, which was our up and down acceleration. Now, I want to just go um, back a slide. And I've actually highlighted it here that it is completely flat. Now, you'll notice that it's completely flat, just under 10 meters per second squared. Now, I think that if I went back to my data, you would probably find that that's really, really close to 9.8 meters per second squared, which is uh, equivalent to gravity. Now, when you're jumping up and down, you can accelerate whilst you're jumping upwards. Then you stop, and then you fall back down. Now, when you're jumping upwards, your speed is really dependent on how fast you can push off with your legs. When you're falling back down, you have no control over how fast you go because of gravity. Okay, Gravity is always going to make you fall at the same rate. And that's pretty much what we've proved here. This is almost like the bowling ball and feather experiment. Okay, There's very traditional experiment in physics where you drop a bowling ball and you drop a feather and they should both hit the ground at the same time except for air resistance. Um, but the fact that an 11-year-old and myself hit the ground um, with the same acceleration sort of proves that gravity is there. So our 9.8 meters per second squared is very, very obvious um, in this plot just here. So there is a huge amount of information that we can gather from these accelerometers that are on your smartphones. That's really what I'm trying to say here. And this is really just one example of something you can do. Um, and I noticed before I missed who said it, but someone mentioned that, you know, yes, yeah, schools do get jumping castles for fun days. I know that a lot of theme parks now um, do have some sort of setup for kids to take accelerometers on rides and gather data about roller coasters. 
But the reality is you don't need a jumping castle to get really, really cool data. Okay? Um, you know, there's, yeah, exactly, Penny. I was about to say mini trampolines, but you beat me to it. Like those little gym trampolines are awesome. Um, some schools have sort of gymnastic setups, and you might have a gymnast in your classroom. Strap a accelerometer that accelerometer to them whilst they go and do some cartwheels and some flips. You know, provided that you can put the phone or the tablet somewhere where it's not going to get smashed if they fall over, um, it's really, really cool to get different types of data. You know, you might find that you've got, you know, kids who play football. If there's a way you can stick a phone in their pocket when they're getting tackled, that would probably give you some cool accelerometer data as well. Um, Ben's just suggested horse riding. Yeah, any sort of movement would be fun. <laughs> shopping trolleys. Yes, shopping trolleys too. Um, so you don't need a jumping castle and you don't need fancy equipment. Like I know that you know, lots of classrooms now have full sets of iPads. Um, lots of schools have some sort of BYO device policy. So you've got it and, you know, the reality is if you're teaching high school, every one of those kids has a smartphone in their pocket. You know, they may not be allowed to have the smartphone at school, but there may be a way that you can make an exception for a really engaging science lesson. And that would involve, you know, everyone installing an accelerometer app and gathering some cool data like I've shown you, downloading it to a CSV file and then playing around with it in Excel. Um, because I know that those sorts of skills are also part of the school curriculum. You know, being able to interpret stuff and use Excel and produce charts um, and stuff like that. And even at, you know, a primary school level, just showing kids that their movement can be measured and their movement has numbers associated with it is really, really useful um, in teaching science. Now, some tips for choosing apps, because like I said, there are literally like tens and thousands of apps. Um, I love free apps, and I love free apps purely for the reason that they're free, and you can download a million of them and play with them, and they're fine. Um, but you do find that occasionally these apps have really annoying pop-up ads, right? And that's because the developer has to make money somehow. Right, so they, you know, install ads on there. They get a little bit of money every time one of those apps, one of those ads pops up. Um, but sometimes they can get in the way. Sometimes those ads can be slightly inappropriate as well. So that's something that you've probably got to watch when you're in a school, you know. And if you've got a really good app that, you know, works and is really, really good, and you're actually using it, it might be worth springing the two dollars for the paid version. Okay, and that's you know going to get rid of your ads. It's probably going to give you more features, um, and, you know, it's also sometimes good just to support those developers if you're using their apps constantly. The next one is the ease of use. Now, I've seen a lot of different apps whereby um, they do lots of really cool things, but they take you sort of an hour to work out what's going on. Um, okay, Linda. Now, Linda's just asked, will free apps eventually have ads? Uh, not necessarily. There are some developers that do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and something like Sparkview that is supported by Pasco who, you know, eventually want to sell you data loggers, um, that doesn't have apps, that doesn't have ads, but um, the majority of your, you know, normal developer apps will have some sort of ad because they've got to make money somehow. So back to my ease of use yet. Basically, you've got to be able to work out how to do it. Now, um, I am probably what you would call a digital native. I've had a computer since I was five. I've had the internet since I was seven. I'm used to pressing buttons and working out what's going on. And there are apps that, you know, have sort of taken me half an hour or an hour to get my head around. Now, from my perspective, if it takes me an hour to work out what's going on in an app, it's not easy to use. Right? If I can work out something in less than 10 minutes, I would say that it's quite easy to use and we would probably be able to teach kids how to use it. Now, the other side of this, unfortunately, is that sometimes kids are better at iPads than we are. You know, lots of these kids have grown up with an iPad in their hand and that may, means that they will pick something up and run with it a lot more easily than a lot of us will. Um, so, 
keep that in mind as well when you're working out whether an app works or not. Now, functionality is basically what the app can do. And there are some apps out there that only do one job, and they do that one job really, really, really well. There are some apps out there that do a thousand things, and they do a thousand things kind of well. So it's sort of measuring up, you know, what functionality do you need, um, what functionality do you want, and what functionality do you have. Um, so that's kind of working that out too. The last one you've got to think about is the platform you're working on, so you know whether you're using an Apple or an Android or a Windows device and the screen size of it. Now, um, I know that Sparkview, which is the one that I was using on the jumping castles, it's pretty much optimised to be used on something with a 10-inch screen and bigger. So a 10-inch screen is like one of your mini-sized tablets, like an iPad mini or one of your Samsung Galaxy tabs, the smaller ones. Um, that's sort of the smallest screen a lot of those work with. Now, that doesn't mean they don't gather data on the other stuff. Like, I know that Sparkview on um, my 6-inch Android phone works quite well, but the one graph you get is really quite squished up and really hard to interpret. So also think about the screen sizes of what you're going to be using. Like, if you're using uh, the smartphone that the kids have in their pockets, you're probably not going to want to analyse the data that it gives you on the screen. You're probably going to want to upload it to a computer. But if you've got an iPad and it's merely just a numbers exercise where you're looking at, okay, we're going to get some numbers and you've got iPads with things, or things with, you know, a reasonable sized screen, you can probably look at the charts that the app itself produces and not go through um, having to upload it to Excel and things. Um, so I know that I've talked a lot about a lot of things with apps and how we can use apps and uh, particularly on this tool side of things. But I hope that I've given you a kind of overview of um, you know, what we can use apps for and maybe just open or expanded your horizons as to, you know, what you might be able to use these for in your classrooms or, you know, encourage your colleagues to do as well. Um, now, I mean, if you want any more information, I will do my best to uh, answer them. Um, my email address is there if you want to contact me directly. Um, otherwise, I am willing to take some questions. You guys have been great on the questions so far um, in the chat screen. but if you've got any others, feel free to speak up because I'm more than happy to answer them. And I think Ben's posting a whole lot of links about apps right now for me, which is good. I think uh, it might be an idea to see if anyone's interested in asking Holly some questions while she why she's still here. And before you all go, and before we take those questions, I just wanted to say a thank you to our sponsors and supporters, the Learning Revolution, the Australia E-Series, and of course, Blackboard Collaborate. And so absolutely wonderful to have you all here this weekend. So, Holly, um, are you ready to take any questions, if anyone's got any? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I know that Peggy asked something about different levels, but I did miss that question, Peggy. Um, so if you want to read type that for me so I don't have to go all the way back up the screen. That would be awesome. Um, for the moment, uh, with Linda, do you have trouble to get teachers to use apps? The short answer to that is yes. Um, in our experience, we have trouble getting most, like I'm not going to say blanketed, but we have trouble getting most teachers to use something that's even a little bit outside the square. You know. Um, a lot of teachers are very comfortable with giving kids uh, iPads and getting them to play games and getting them to, you know, go on the internet and use them as research devices and things like that. But in terms of using it as a real tool in the classroom, I haven't come across many teachers that have even thought about doing it. You know, it's, um, I guess, unless you're familiar with what these sensors can do, you might not even think about it. So there are certain apps that teachers use, and that's because they have to use uh, them. But uh, I guess some physics teachers would be using Sparkview with the stuff that they've already got. I think a lot of teachers don't realise that they can use some of this stuff without the fancy equipment that goes with it. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can get some more people using these things. 
Uh, Bron, you've asked, how do we get, how do you get less savvy teachers to engage? That's another really, really difficult question to answer. Um, sometimes it's just a kick into the 21st century. Um, now, I mean, from my perspective, I find it really frustrating when people don't want to engage with technology, but that is, again, a generational thing, and I need to understand that. Like I said, I've grown up with a computer in my hand and a phone in my pocket. So for me, using these things is second nature, and I understand that for a lot of people that's not the case. I think it's um, a matter of making it less scary. Like, I know that with my parents and my grandparents and getting them um, into the sphere of using devices and apps, a lot of it comes down to what if I break it? Um, and what they don't realise is that I learned how to use these things by pressing buttons until I broke something. So um, I think it's getting these less savvy, te less savvy teachers to just not be so scared of the devices, not be so scared about pressing things. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to really, really break something, a screen, come up, a screen comes up and says, are you sure you want to do this? Um, so you do kind of get a warning before you break stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's another battle, but something we can try. Now, Peggy says, is it, does it make sense to find apps that have multiple levels of difficult challenge from simple to advanced? Uh, Peggy, in terms of games and things, I think that can be useful. Um, most games do have that built in, though. You know, they have different levels, and a more advanced uh, student will get through those easy levels really, really quickly. Um, whereas, you know, your less advanced students will stay on simple. Now, with your data logging apps, I don't think there is a simple version just because uh, I think developers feel that if they're going to be measuring data, they're going to measure it all and not just measure one thing. Um, so there's not so much thing about, about a simple app, but you can make the workup of the data. So looking at it Excel and making charts from it a little bit easier. Um, yeah, Rachel, I very much agree that more training is needed, but then it comes down to a question of who's going to do that training. Um, I know that, you know, lots of teachers are already stretched and getting teachers, getting some teachers and some schools to do science in the first place is hard enough, let alone throwing them the curveball that they might be using tablets and using really, really um, cool things in order to do it. All right, does anyone else have any more questions uh, whilst we're here? Thank you all for coming out, by the way. It's really cool to see that there's sort of 15 of you guys out there listening right now, um, and anyone who's listening to this sort of retrospectively too. <laughs> yeah, Carol, that's a great idea. Let's get some more teachers in on sessions like this, and maybe um, they will start using these apps and using their devices to do some cool things. <sighs> Okay, guys. Um, so, yeah, we might finish that up there. But thank you, everyone, from coming, for coming along and contributing. Uh, yeah, some of those questions you guys um, posed were really, really good and actually got me thinking about some stuff that I might look at over the weekend. Um, so thanks for coming along. And, yeah, don't be afraid to contact me if you want any more information and things. So thanks. Thank you, Holly. That was wonderful. I think someone's got their hand up there. I'll just check and see. I know the hand's down again. But thank you very much for coming, Holly. That was absolutely wonderful. I'll turn that recording off. And just remember, thank you, everyone. And thanks for coming. And don't forget the rest of the sessions. Share around that we're here, too. And again, thank you to our sponsors for allowing us all to be here. Thank you, Holly. Bye. No problem. Bye.